All right, The Passion and the Glory, uh, lesson number three in this uh, series, entitled His Last Miracle. Well, the uh, apostles record that Jesus performed uh, many miracles. John says that if everything Jesus did was recorded, the world could not contain all the books that these uh, would uh, fill, John chapter 21, verse uh, 55. However, the greatest miracle in Jesus' ministry was His last miracle, and that was His resurrection from the dead. Think about it, uh, feeding the 5,000, uh, walking on water, these things would be meaningless if He had not been raised from the dead, His final and most triumphal uh, miracle. So in this lesson, I want to describe the details that surround the greatest event in history, and that is the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. Let's begin with the tomb. Uh, in those days, uh, people were buried in tombs, the side of a hill, the side of a mountain, usually a uh, stone three or four feet um, uh, across, circular type stone, uh, would lay over a space cut in the side of a mountain. And in Jesus' case, this is where he would come to rest after his suffering and death on the cross. We know that a seal was set on the stone so no tampering uh, could take place um, uh, with, uh, the, um, with the location itself. Uh, the body is uh, wrapped using several layers of bandages. And uh, when the process uh, was complete, these bandages would be tightly enfolded with spices placed in between each layer. Uh, we know also that Jesus' head was uh, covered with a napkin. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have laid him in his tomb on Friday afternoon after receiving permission to remove the body from the scene of his death. We also know that several guards have been set in place to prevent anyone from tampering or especially stealing uh, the body and then claiming that there was a resurrection. The Jews were especially uh, worried about this. The resurrection itself takes place on Sunday morning, somewhere around 5 a.m. An earthquake shakes the ground where the tomb is and an angel in bright white appears and rolls away the stone. Now the Lord, however, has already left the tomb. The angel's action merely announces what has previously taken place. The pagan soldiers guarding the area fall to the ground in fear, and their reaction is due to the appearance of the angel and not the resurrection of Jesus, which as pagans, they were not privileged to witness. Eventually, these uh, guards uh, run to the high priest and report what has taken place. They are then bribed to say that the disciples stole the body while they slept, and they were told that they would be protected. They could tell that story and they wouldn't get into trouble. Soon after, Mary Magdalene and some other women arrive at the tomb with the hope of finishing the burial process that had begun on the body, but had to be stopped because of the approaching Sabbath. You weren't allowed to handle uh, a body um, on the Sabbath. Uh, the women see the stone that is rolled away. They notice the tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene leaves immediately to tell the apostles that Jesus' body is no longer in its place. The other women, however, remain at the tomb for a time. Angels then appear to these women and announce that Jesus has in fact risen from the dead. At this point, they also leave to tell the apostles what they have seen and heard from the angel. Mary returns uh, with Peter and John and uh, they look inside the tomb. The bandages that had been wrapped around Jesus' body are still intact, they're not cut, they're not loosened or unwrapped, suggesting that Jesus simply rose through them. The form is still there, but the bandages are empty. And of course, we learned that neatly folded in the corner of the tomb, they see the napkin that had originally covered the Lord's face. Peter and John depart from that place and return home, leaving Mary Magdalene alone, crying and confused. The angels then appear to Mary, asking her why she is crying, and she answers that someone has taken away the body of the Lord, her Lord, and this is what was making her uh, weep. 
Uh, at this point, the Bible describes the first of Jesus' 12 recorded appearances. So here we go, the first one would be Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20. While still weeping, Mary hears Jesus calling her name. She turns, thinking it's one of the gardeners, but recognizing Jesus, she cries out, Rabboni, which means teacher, and she clings to him. He gently pushes her away, reassuring her that she will not lose him. Jesus then tells her to go and announce the good news of his resurrection to the others. And so she responds quickly by returning to where the apostles are located and she reports what she has seen. Unfortunately, they do not believe her. The second appearance to the women, Matthew 28 verses eight to 10. In the meantime, the other women still on their way to tell the apostles what the angel has told them when Jesus suddenly appears to them, at which point they recognize and worship him. He instructs them to tell the apostles that he will meet them in Galilee. I want you to notice something here. Uh, the, the first appearances, the first two appearances, which you know, are pretty, they're all important, but those two especially important, two appearances to women. Jesus has not appeared to a man yet until the third appearance, and that is to Peter, Luke 24, 34, and 1 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians 15, 5. After the women have reported the news to Peter and he refuses to believe them, Jesus appears to Peter when he is alone. We don't have any details of this meeting, only that it took place. The fourth appearance to two men on the road to Emmaus, Mark 16, 12 and Luke 24. Two men are leaving Jerusalem and traveling to the town of Emmaus, roughly seven miles from Jerusalem. And on their way, they meet a stranger and they begin discussing the events of the past week, along with the story of the female disciples seeing an angel at Jesus' tomb. Now they're confused and so the stranger explains to them how the resurrection of the Messiah was in accord with the Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. And so they invite the stranger into their home and as they share a meal together, they recognize that the stranger is actually Jesus, at which point he disappears from their midst. The two men quickly return to Jerusalem that same night and they report this amazing encounter with the Lord to the apostles, which brings us to the next appearance, and that is Jesus appears to the apostles. Luke 24, verses 35 to 49. Now while these men are explaining their experience, Jesus appears among them and says, peace be with you. Now they're all afraid, thinking they've seen a ghost, but Jesus then shows them his hands and feet. He even asks for some food, and they give him uh, you know, some fish to eat. All of this done to demonstrate that he was physically in their presence and not some sort of ghostly appearance. The Lord then teaches them about the resurrection and how this was happening according to the prophecies about him in the Old Testament. Notice, even the great miracles are always tied back to the scriptures. They don't just stand by themselves. All right? uh, Jesus, of course, opens their minds and gives them understanding of the scriptures concerning himself and his work as the Messiah. He also tells the apostles that they will have to go and proclaim his resurrection, but to wait until they receive power from the Holy Spirit before beginning this task. And so the, these first five appearances that I've just described, these happen on the first day of his resurrection. The sixth appearance to another apostle, Thomas this time, John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Uh, after his last appearance before them, the apostles tell Thomas, who was not present when Jesus first appeared to them, that the Lord is risen and he has appeared to them, but Thomas does not believe. One week later, Jesus again appears to the apostles and this time Thomas is among them and he's invited by the Lord to touch the holes in his hands and in his side. Thomas responds by falling down and worshiping Jesus saying, my Lord and my God. The seventh appearance to the apostles by the shore, John 21, verses one to 24. Well, the apostles are restless. They've been told that they're going to receive power and they, you know, to wait, 
but they're restless, still waiting for the spirit, still waiting for the power. Peter then decides to return home and go fishing. And so they set out in their boat, they catch nothing all night. Jesus appears on the shore and he tells them to try casting their nets on the other side of the boat, which results in a great catch. Once ashore, they eat with Jesus by the fire and the Lord tells Peter to feed his lambs. And then he asks if the apostle truly loves him. And he repeats that question three times. Well, we need to understand that on the night preceding Jesus' death, Peter denied knowing the Lord three times. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, the apostle is asked to confirm his love for the Lord three times. One confession of love for each previous denial. The eighth appearance, again to the apostles, this time on the mountain. Matthew 28, 18, 20. Let's read that, what Jesus says to them at this particular appearance. It says, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We have a similar you know, similar command in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. So the apostles were gathered at a designated place in Galilee and Jesus comes to them there and he gives them instructions concerning, first of all, his authority, the fact that he possesses all authority in heaven and on earth. Secondly, information about their ministry. They're to preach the gospel and baptize repentant believers and teach the disciples to know and obey all the things that Jesus commanded. And thirdly, he instructs them about power, their power. The Holy Spirit will empower them to do miracles in order to confirm their ministry. The ninth appearance to 500 brethren, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We don't have a lot of information about this particular meeting, only the fact that Jesus appears to over 500 Christians at one time uh, during a special gathering at some point. The next uh, appearance, number 10, he appears to uh, James, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. He appears to James, James who is the writer of the epistle and also who was Jesus' earthly brother. And we know that James did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah while he was alive uh, and he was converted uh, afterwards. And so Jesus appears to James. I am always touched by the idea that Jesus appears to his earthly brother, the one who rejected him, the one who didn't exactly make fun of him, but didn't take seriously. You know, if you're really serious about this Messiah business, you, know, you ought to go to Jerusalem where all the people are. You know? uh, didn't really take him too seriously. And now uh, the love and the kindness of the Lord that he appears to his earthly brother uh, to bring him to, uh, to faith, a, a, a wonderful story there. Um, uh, number um, 11, appearance number 11, again to the apostles before his ascension. In Acts chapter one, verses nine to 11, this is the final appearance to the apostles before his return to heaven, which they witnessed. And so when you think about all of the appearances, over 500 people of all kinds, women, men, uh, people who are older, people who are younger, educated, less educated, disciples, all of these people saw Jesus and they saw him in the daytime, some, some saw him at night, they saw him indoors as well as outdoors. For over a period of a month, Jesus ate and talked with and touched and comforted his disciples in preparation for his return to heaven. I mention that because whenever we hear of some religious prophet or, or leader, they always have their vision by themselves in the dark, nobody else is there to confirm that they saw God or they had this vision or, the, or an angel spoke to them. They're always by themselves and it usually has happened only once or twice. Here you have Jesus appearing to over 500 people uh, over a month uh, period, uh, in the daytime, at night, inside, outside, you know, all kinds of appearances. We've noted 11 here so far to demonstrate the legitimacy of his claim uh, of resurrection. And then of course the 12th appearance 
and that is to Saul, that we know as Paul, Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter nine. Saul, the Pharisee, sent by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem to arrest and imprison Christians in a bid to destroy this, this young church. He's blinded and called by Jesus to reverse course and devote, uh, devote himself to establishing the church among the Gentiles. After receiving his sight and hearing the gospel message, Saul is baptized and he begins his preaching ministry that will eventually send him to a Roman prison and execution for a cause he so violently opposed before Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. That's the, the final appearance. Now I've said that the resurrection of Jesus was his final and greatest miracle. It was also his most necessary miracle because through the resurrection, Jesus accomplishes three very important things. First of all, the resurrection establishes Jesus as the divine Messiah. Many say that they believe in reincarnation, for example, or uh, they have once uh, been alive in another form. But Jesus claims to have returned as himself. This accomplishment entitles him to be considered Lord and Christ. And Paul points this out in Romans chapter one when he writes, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so resurrection matters because it provides scriptural and historical confirmation of Jesus' true identity the Son of God. Uh, the resurrection is important because it produces faith. It produces faith in an individual. I mean, we can demonstrate that the Bible is a, an inspiring book, that the Bible is revelation of God. We can prove that in a variety of ways. Uh, the accuracy of prophecy, hundreds of prophecies made in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. And so no other book contains fulfilled prophecy as does the Bible. It sets it apart from all other holy books, if you wish. Also the harmony of complex material. The Bible is composed of 66 individual books written by 40 plus authors, produced over a period of 1500 years, and yet it tells a single story without confusion or contradiction. I mean, no other book resembles or even compares to this. And then thirdly, the superiority of thought that it has. No other book contains the theological, philosophical, social and ethical, moral and historical information at this level that has survived examination and criticism for nearly 2,000 years without destruction or being relegated to irrelevance. Only the Bible has survived that. Note, however, that Jesus did not send his apostles out to convince men according to the accuracy, the harmony, or the superiority of the scriptures, but rather by their personal eyewitness of his resurrection. When Peter got up to preach, he didn't, he didn't preach, you know, the scriptures, they're from God, you should believe them. That's not what he preached. When he got up on Pentecost Sunday, he preached the resurrection of Jesus. You see, doubters and disbelievers are not persuaded by logical arguments about God's word. They're persuaded by God's power as seen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Prophecy, accuracy of scripture, Superiority of thought may convince you to believe that the Bible is a special book, but that in itself will not save your soul. A lot of people believe that the Bible is a special book, but they're not saved. It's faith in Jesus as the Son of God, produced by the witness of the resurrection, recorded in the Bible, that saves men from hell. Not the belief that Bible comes from God. Without resurrection, Faith is not possible, certainly not at this level. And then thirdly, the resurrection is important because it eliminates man's greatest fear, which is death. Let me read a passage out of Hebrews that talks about this. 
It says, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, speaking of Jesus, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. We know that from the fall of Adam, death has been man's greatest fear. People give themselves over to this world, to sin. They're discouraged in the doing of good because they believe in death's final power. They mistakenly think that this life is all there is, so they act without considering that they'll be judged by a righteous God who has the power of heaven or hell over all souls. Paul describes the final victory of the Christian, the victory over death made possible by the resurrection of Jesus. He writes in 1 Corinthians 15, but when this, when this perishable will have, uh, will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is in the law, is the law, excuse me. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now someone may ask, how does the resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years ago give us resurrection in the future? Well, Jesus himself answers that question in John chapter six. He says, this is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. That's a promise from Jesus himself. Why is that promise you know, so important? Because he himself has resurrected. If he has the power to resurrect, himself, he has the power to resurrect us. And so the resurrection is necessary to destroy the fear of death, to show that death is not final, that it can and has been defeated, and the one who defeated it also has the power to give this victory to other people. The greatest promise of the gospel is that for all who believe in Christ Jesus, personal resurrection from the dead will be a reality for them in the same way that it was a reality for Jesus. God requires faith, but not blind faith. He promises us that there is life after this life, and He's provided the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the once for all proof that this is so. If you're wondering, should I believe? Shouldn't I believe? Is this true what God is you know, offering me? Believe it, believe it, because God has given us the proof of His power to resurrect us and His desire to resurrect us by resurrecting Jesus Christ. Well, let's kind of summarize here what we've talked about. The resurrection was the final miracle and most important one for us for several reasons. First of all, it is what separates Jesus Christ from every other religious prophet or leader in history. None of them have ever claimed a personal resurrection, only Jesus. Through his resurrection, God established Jesus as his only divine Son, Lord of all creation, and Savior of all the world, and all of this according to his word. Secondly, the resurrection is important because it is the spark by which the flame of our faith is lit, as I said previously. Skeptics and doubters are not convinced by the love of God, but by the power of God as seen in the resurrection. I can believe what Jesus said and obey what he has commanded me to do because of this unmistakable sign. Who else has this power? Well, no one. And then thirdly, the resurrection gives me real hope for my own resurrection. Prophets, astrologers, spiritualists, they can write all they want about the tunnel or the light that they have experienced in near-death situations. Only Jesus, however, dies and comes back three days later and promises me the very same experience. 
Let's read from John chapter 10, shall we? Jesus says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So here John tells us that Jesus has the ability to promise me this thing because He has the power over life and death and His resurrection is the proof of that. So before the final miracle of resurrection occurred in Jesus' life, He had to bear the cross. First there was the death and the burial and then there was the glorious uh, resurrection. And so this sets a pattern for our own lives. The final miracle will be our own glorious resurrection from physical death to be uh, together with God forever in heaven. But before this can happen, we also must undergo a death and a burial and a resurrection. As Paul states in Romans chapter six, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul tells us that this recreation on our part takes place in the waters of baptism. We die to sin in repentance, we are buried in the waters of baptism, and then we are resurrected through faith by Jesus Christ. And so Jesus' final miracle is available to all who come to Him in this manner. All right, so much for the final miracle, Jesus' last miracle. Our next lesson, we're going to talk about Jesus' last command. I thank you for your attention at this time.